Good morning and welcome to an online event brought to you by Parkinson's Community Los Angeles and Boston Scientific. Today we are talking about the role of deep brain stimulation surgery in Parkinson's treatment. I am Angela Neff and I serve on PCLA's Board of Directors. For those of you who don't know us, we are a Los Angeles-based nonprofit that supports families living with Parkinson's disease through our free online education events, support groups, our information and referral program, and much more. All of PCLA's programs are also made possible by our generous sponsors like Boston Scientific and through donations from the Parkinson's community. If you appreciate the work we do, and the support we offer, I hope you will consider making a donation on our website at www.pcla.org. Thank you. Just a few quick notes before we get started. We are recording today's event for the YouTube channel and you will not be visible in the recording unless you are speaking. So please stay muted to keep background noise at a minimum and after the presentation, there will be plenty of time for questions. We will submit questions through the chat. Please join me in welcoming our speaker today. Dr. Zenos Mason is a movement disorders neurologist and assistant professor of neurology at the University of Southern California. He came to Southern California from Boston, where he completed his medical degree at Harvard Medical School and his neurology residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Mason's clinical and research interests are in the use and development of deep brain stimulation as a treatment for movement disorders. We are honored that Dr. Mason also serves on PCLA's Volunteer Medical Advisory Board. Thank you, Dr. Mason, for joining us today. Thank you, Angela, for the very kind introduction. It really is an honor to be here, and I know that uh, many of you have probably heard uh, this talk or similar talks that I've given in the past, and it's just it's always a pleasure to come and speak to everybody. So um, I'm looking forward to today and looking forward to the discussion uh, in a few minutes. So first of all, and importantly, I don't have any conflicts of interest, uh, financial or otherwise related to the content of this talk. I work in this arena, and so I do interface very closely with the manufacturers of these devices, and that's something that you should know. But I'm not being uh, compensated in any way financial and otherwise for this talk. Um, but you should know that Boston Scientific has sponsored this event, uh, has asked me specifically to speak, and has also supplied several slides at the end of the talk. And those are clearly labeled as Boston Scientific slides. And I use them because they, they give some excellent illustrations in some cases and, um, and uh, are very useful to sort of all of our uh, collective understanding of these issues. So just helps to facilitate discussion. Um, but all of that said, I'm happy to answer any questions about this at the end, uh, along with any others. So Many of you have heard this before, and so thank you to my old friends for coming back and joining for another talk, but some of you probably have not. And so we'll go over uh, what deep brain stimulation is and how it works first. And then briefly, I wanna cover factors to consider in your decision-making around deep brain stimulation, uh, who it's good for, what to expect as a result of DBS surgery, uh, where in the brain we can stimulate with electricity and how uh, the surgery is done, and then what kinds of decision um, decisions will be necessary when uh, you're pursuing, if you pursue um, deep brain stimulation, like what device to choose and what battery to choose. And then I want to spend a lot of the talk today talking about new and future innovations. And, and we'll talk about how imaging and MRI can help guide DBS programming. And hopefully you'll understand a little bit about uh, what I mean by the end of the talk. So there are three components to a deep brain stimulation system. It is basically a pacemaker for the brain. And so the three components are the pacemaker itself, the battery, it's also known as an implantable pulse generator. And that is placed into uh, under the skin in the chest, just below the clavicle or collarbone. That is connected to a wire that runs up under the skin of the neck. And then itself connects to two electrodes. And these electrodes are implanted through small holes in the skull 
uh, directly into the targets of the brain. And these targets are deep, they're not superficial, they're not on the surface of the brain, but rather deep in the middle of the brain. And uh, hence the name, deep brain stimulation. So we'll get into each of these components in a little, well, a couple of these components in a little more detail. But first I'd like to use some graphs to illustrate how deep brain stimulation works and what it's actually doing. So I know we all love graphs. I certainly love graphs. So um, this is a graph of the concentrations of medication in your blood when you're taking something like Cinemet three times a day. So early in the course of Parkinson disease, Cinemet three times a day is sort of the mainstay of treatment. Uh, that's what many of my patients and many patients kind of across the world get started on when they're first diagnosed with Parkinson disease. And it's often enough on its own to control the symptoms of Parkinson disease. And that's because early in Parkinson disease, or for, in some cases for many, many years, the brain does a really good job at, at handling the medication and has some extra dopamine to provide to the brain. Um, and so three times a day medication is all you might need. So that's represented here by this black dotted line. And that is the, the lower threshold below which you might have feelings of stiffness or slowness or tremor, those symptoms that might've led to your diagnosis with Parkinson's disease. But as long as you stay above that dotted line, uh, you feel better. You feel like the medications are working. And then there's an upper dotted line in red. And above that upper dotted line, you might have excess movements. And those, some of your doctors will call dyskinesias, but you'll recognize those movements as kind of dancing, flowing, restless, excessive movements, you know, often in the head, sometimes in the trunk or arms or legs. And, and that can occur for many, many years and not really be bothersome at all. And in other cases that can really be annoying or can uh, interfere with daily function. So those dyskinesias happen when the medications go above a certain threshold, All right? So those two thresholds, as long as you stay in the middle, you're doing well, you're feeling smooth, you're feeling like the medications are working and, and um, you don't have any of the excess movements. So as time passes, in some cases, Parkinson's disease might change and the ability of the brain to buffer the medications might change. And so that lower threshold might change and rise up a little bit. And so if you imagine each of these little mountains, this is one dose of medication, right? And so you, you take your ski lift to the top of the mountain, uh, when you take that dose and then you slowly come down this mountain and right about here at about 11 o'clock a.m after taking a dose around seven you start to have a bit of slowness right or you feel like the medications are maybe wearing off and that's something that some of you might have experienced in the past but then you take your noon your midday medication dose and you pop back up to the top of the second mountain and you start to ski back down and the same thing happens towards the end of the day and so this is what's called wearing off and and sometimes in our field is called a motor fluctuation. It just means that the amount of symptom control that you have throughout the day fluctuates and you have good periods and bad periods. It's an important concept to understand when we're thinking about deep brain stimulation. And so what we do as, uh, as doctors and together as a team is maybe add on a medication like Azelect. And that Azelect sort of pops everything up a little bit. It raises the height of all those mountains so that by the time you get to the bottom of the mountain and you're heading back up for your next dose, you never have crossed below that lower threshold. So that's why we add certain medications on top of levodopa. Okay, but as the disease changes, as Parkinson's disease changes with time, it may be the case that that threshold continues to rise. And so even though the mountains are a little bit higher, as you're skiing down, you pop below that lower threshold and you have some wearing off again. But there's other strategies that we can take, right? We can add additional medications and one of them is called Comptan. So if you look at the slope of those, of those uh, mountains, you know, we've changed here from a, like a black diamond to a blue square. It's become a little less steep. So the breakdown of that medication over time in the blood is slowed down. And so you spend more time in this good range with these additional medications. And that's basically how they work. So you're still having a little bit of time in the, in the slow period here. And so we can, we can use other strategies like to increase the number of doses per day of the Cinemet that you take. And you're still just carrying along with this. You're looking at the black line here. So by increasing from three times a day to five times a day, you're preventing yourself from dipping into this slow period. But now as the medications start to build up in the blood, you're getting higher and higher. And here you begin to cross over this upper threshold. 
So maybe now it's been 10 years and you've had Parkinson disease and you feel pretty good throughout the day, but you're having a, a little bit of excess movement. And if we increase the medications any further, those excess movements will perhaps get a little bit worse. And so staying in this range has after you know, five, 10, 15 years of having Parkinson's disease, it's become difficult, even with a lot of medication adjustments. So with time, and this doesn't happen in anybody, in everybody, but with some people, this range narrows to be very, very small. So most of the day, some people are spending feeling slow and stiff or have excess movements those dyskinesias, and sometimes those aren't bothersome and sometimes they are, right? But the idea is that as the disease changes, a lot of the changes that, a lot of the adjustments that we make in medications are just not enough to keep people where they wanna be in that nice middle range. And this is where deep brain stimulation can be useful because what it does is not change the way that the medications are acting in the blood or the brain. What it does is take this range here, the space between the red and the black lines, and expand it again so that with the same doses of medications, you're staying in that middle range more time and you have more good time throughout the day where you're well-treated, the medications are working well, but you don't have excess movements. You don't have bothersome side effects. At a simple level with the use of a lot of colored lines, that is what deep brain stimulation is doing together with the medications. And this is a nice summary uh, that was adapted from uh, one of the device manufacturers, each dose of medication here is represented by a tablet. And there's a big swing, you know, this is perhaps after 15 years of having Parkinson's disease, there's a big swing. So you go from having off time to having excess movement before DBS. And this blue zone is your good zone. DBS expands that blue zone. So that's just a simple summary of everything that we've just talked about over the last five minutes. And I can answer questions about that. So am I a candidate? I'll go through this quickly, but we, we would like to be sure that you have a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And so it's, if it's only been a year or two, we wanna wait a little bit before, before thinking about deep brain stimulation, even if you have symptoms that aren't responding well to the medications. And that's to make sure that we're not dealing with a disease that can look like Parkinson's disease, but respond differently. And examples of those are multiple system atrophy or uh, Lewy body disease. These are diseases that can act like Parkinson's disease, but then um, behave differently with time. We want to see that you have these on off fluctuations that's dipping below that black line on the mountain and or these excess movements. And we want to see a good match between symptoms which respond to the medications and the symptoms which are impairing your quality of life. Okay. And this is, I'll just emphasize this because uh, it's what was emphasized to me in my training and what I emphasize with my patients and my practice at USC. DBS is not for everyone. And we want to be sure when you come to us, that the symptoms that are impairing your quality of life and that are bothersome to you are the same symptoms that are most likely to respond to surgery. So there has to be a good match between bothersome, functionally disabling symptoms and the things that surgery can offer you. And that is uh, sometimes complicated and, and you'll learn whether that is the case after a, a discussion with a, a specialist, movement disorders specialist or a neurosurgeon. And in some cases, if you're unable to take medications for Parkinson's disease because of side effects, that's another situation where you may be a candidate for deep brain stimulation. What can you expect from surgery? Well, this is unique to each person and your neurologist, your movement disorder specialist, your neurosurgeon will discuss this with you. But in broad strokes, gait and balance problems are the least likely to respond to deep brain stimulation. And so if those are issues that are bothersome for you and affecting your quality of life, those would not be as likely to improve after the surgery. But in well-chosen patients, specific symptoms are extremely likely to improve. And there's a greater to 90 to, than 90 to 95% likelihood that those symptoms will improve after surgery. But how much improvement can you expect to see? There are some rules of thumbs. One I've already emphasized, and that's that Symptoms which respond and improve with medications, even if the, it's only partial improvement, are the ones that are most likely to respond to stimulation. And it's all about just keeping you in that well-treated range without dipping too low or getting too high. Generally, the best that deep brain stimulation can do is reproduce your best on time. So the best the medications can do is the best that the surgery can do. 
but it'll keep you in that zone for longer throughout the day. So if you're only having an hour or two of really good on time with the medications per day, without bothersome dyskinesias, excess movements, that might expand to four, six, eight, perhaps more hours. Symptoms which don't respond to the medications, and in many cases that's, that's gait and balance problems, sometimes freezing, those just don't get better with medications in some cases. Those are not also likely to respond to the surgery. The exception to that is tremor. In some cases, tremor really doesn't respond very well to meds at all, and we can really treat the tremor more effectively with the electrical stimulation of the brain. I'll go through this slide pretty quickly, but this is just the, the journey that you would expect to undertake for surgery. So you'd be evaluated by a neurologist and a neurosurgeon. And then a couple months later, usually you undergo the first stage of the surgery, which is the placement of the electrodes in the brain. And that can be asleep or awake at USC, uh, this surgery, and I'll talk about the differences. And then you, two, a couple of weeks later, you have the battery placed in the chest. Uh, but a month after that, you have the programming and activation of the deep brain stimulator device. And then every three months thereafter. So really it's about, a, it's about six to 12 months between the initial evaluation and the recovery and a time where you're really feeling like the surgery is working well for you. So this is not an instant fix, but in most, uh, in most carefully chosen people, they can see real benefits in in that six to 12 month period. And then thereafter the deep brain stimulation lasts uh, to the best of our knowledge, as long as, um, uh, as long as we've been able to study it. So uh, there are some patients who've had the stimulator devices in for uh, about 20 years and it remains effective over that period of time. So where in the brain to stimulate? Well, I'm gonna cover this later. So I'll just say briefly, this is a slice of the brain taken out like uh, a slice of a loaf of bread. Okay, so this line here through the middle of the brain, we've just taken a slice and we're looking through the center of the brain. This is the surface of, this, of the brain. And then these are the structures in the middle that we actually wanna stimulate with electricity. Here, the, the thalamus is one, but much more important in Parkinson disease is this globus pallidus and the subthalamic nucleus, this small one here. So each of them have their advantages and disadvantages, which we won't get into, but I'm happy to answer questions on. But you'll see how deep and how small these targets are. The surgery can be performed asleep, which is entirely guided by MRI. And the surgery here you, you see is done actually inside the bore of an MRI. Uh, the MRI suite is converted to a surgical suite. Everything is sterile. And the entire brain surgery is done uh, while you're asleep and inside the MRI. And that allows for precise targeting of the electrode without any testing that requires you to be awake. The, uh, this is offered at USC and we're the only center in, in uh, Southern California to offer. They also do this procedure up at UCSF. Um, but the uh, more common way to perform this procedure and the way that it was performed for about 15 years um, in, in isolation is to wake the patient up during the procedure to do physical examination, testing and electrical recording to make sure that the electrode is going into the right place. And both techniques are used at, at USC and else um, uh, are used at USC and both are uh, equally effective. So you'll also have to think about what device to choose. And the easy answer here is that every one of these devices is going to work well. It's going to uh, treat symptoms in similar ways and they each have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, but Abbott Boston Scientific and Medtronic are the three approved uh, device manufacturers. You'll also have to choose whether you go with a battery, an implantable pulse generator that you recharge once a day or once a week, or that you set and forget and never have to recharge. So the single charge devices last between two and five years, and then they have to be taken out using, it's just a, um, a surgery that lasts about an hour, incision made in the skin, battery taken out, replaced with a new battery. So that would need to be done every two to five years. Alternatively, the rechargeable batteries last upwards of 10 to 15, perhaps longer uh, in some cases, and they don't need to be uh, replaced every two to five years, but again, they do need to be recharged. So that's a decision that you can make with your neurologist as well. And just another, uh, uh, another fork point to be aware of. 
So now we'll get into future innovations and, and we'll talk about image guided programming, which I knew is, uh, which I know for many of you is going to be the new element of this talk that you might have not heard before. So first of all, though, there are also devices in this new directions category that are able not only to stimulate the brain, but also to record the electrical information from the brain. And you know that, uh, that brain cells are electrical cells. And so every time they fire and are active, they put out a little electrical signal. And that signal can actually be measured by a circuit. And when the electrode is planted in the brain, it's not just a stimulator, but it can actually act as a measuring device. So this is an example of some of the recordings that we can uh, make from areas of the brain. And we can use this information uh, to shape the stimulation itself. So in the future, this may work as a closed loop system, sort of like your thermostat, might take information from the brain and use that information to modify the stimulation, just the way that your thermostat reads the ambient temperature of the air and uses that information to change the way that the furnace operates by increasing or decreasing the output of the, of the heat, right? And that can feed back then to the thermostat. And in the same way, we're hoping that deep brain stimulation can act as a closed loop system where we can measure from the brain, stimulate the brain based on those uh, measurements. And then for that stimulation and the resultant changes in those measurements to feed back to the system. So this will allow us to shape the stimulation and use the stimulation in a more precise way. This is still at least a few years off, but the devices that are capable of measuring signals are in current use. So we can look at those signals and we can make some decisions based on those signals, but it's early, we are not sure how to use the, the information um, at this point in a consistent way, uh, but we are certainly learning and there's new papers coming out every month on this on these topics. Another future, another current innovation from Abbott, uh, one of the other three device manufacturers is remote programming. Um, Abbott is uh, right now the only FDA approved manufacturer that's um, that offers uh, this technology. So you can be at home and you can uh, FaceTime with your doctor over this specific program that's, uh, that's uh, approved for use by the FDA. And your doctor using this program uh, can see you over the video and can also make changes in the DBS system over the internet. And this is secure. Uh, there's a very little chance of this being hacked. You know, the signals are sent through a very safe server. Um, and so it's secure and HIPAA compliant. Uh, but this allows you to be at home, especially useful to you if you live you know, many hours away from the center that you might receive the DBS. So I have plenty of patients up in Bakersfield or North uh, in Kern, uh, Kern County or um, in, uh, you know, even farther up in the Central Valley towards, um, well, I'm blanking here, but anyways, um, two or three hours North. and. Uh, they use this technology to uh, beam in and we can make changes in their stimulator. So we wanted to spend a few minutes today talking about image guided programming. Um, the only manufacturer right now to have uh, FDA approval of an integrated image guided programming system is Boston, although Medtronic is also investing in this technology and, and I expect it to be um, to be more heavily used by the Medtronic systems in the coming years as well. But the basic way that this works is to combine information from your specific MRI, your brain image with a CT scan so that we can see where the electrode is in your brain in a 3D reconstruction. All right, and so I'm gonna explain, uh, explain that here using the Boston Scientific slides. So, this is a little bit simplistic and and uh, I, I do want to um, uh, I do want to qualify a couple of things on these slides. But so when we're stimulating in the brain, we want to deliver the electricity really precisely and we want to deliver it in a way that treats your symptoms well. And we can we can make changes in many of the parameters of the stimulation. The number of times the electricity is given per second, for example, or the amount of electricity that's um, that's measured in, in amplitude in um, in milliamps or we can change exactly where it goes, what contact on the electrode that, that the electricity flows out. 
So here, if the forest represents your brain, you know, we want to only stimulate in one specific area. And we want to do that because surrounding areas might, might produce side effects, but only a small area of the brain is going to give you the efficacy on symptom control. So uh, here that's represented as a little treasure chest in this sweet spot in the brain. And so the image guidance is sort of like having a map to go and find that treasure. So here, you know, the Boston has uh, designed this, this enchanted forest picture here to look a little bit like the brain, uh, which is pretty effective. You know, when we're programming these devices, we spend some time with you and we spend, you know, one to two hours programming the device initially to find exactly where that stimulation should go. But we are doing that by using an examination. We're seeing how well your tremor is controlled. We're feeling the amount of stiffness in your limbs. We're watching you to see how quick or slow your movements are. And that, you know, and our clinical expertise is effective and we can always find, or almost always find the most effective contact to stimulate and avoid side effects using this method. Uh, but image guidance is a new technology that we are going to use as an additional tool in this process. So the way that we've been doing it for 20 years and is, and is very effective is has not been using an image map, you know, and it is somewhat challenging and time consuming. And that's why we you know, need to take two hours in clinic. You know, it's not often that you spend two hours with your doctor uh, in a, uh, in a single clinic visit. So the distinction here is you know, to add daylight to this forest so that we can go and find exactly what that sweet spot is. And that's what image guidance kind of allows us to do. Okay, so let's talk about exactly how that's done. I've hinted at that by saying MRI and CT scan. So on the left side of the screen here is an MRI scan. And even, you know, these are, these are different planes. And so this plane is looking at the midline plane. And so it's sort of taking a slice down. You can see the nose here from a, from a side view. And this plane is actually doing here. So it's taking a top down view, but you can tell the difference between an MRI and a CT scan in just the amount of detail that you can see in the structure. You probably know that you can see much more on an MRI. The contrast and resolution is much better. And so what we want to do to guide our programming is use MRI information. Now, unfortunately, when we put that metal electrode into the brain, a metal electrode interferes with a magnetic resonance image, unfortunately. And so that warps and distorts the image and it doesn't allow us to know exactly where that electrode is placed. And we know where we place it because of surgical techniques and clinical techniques and uh, electrophysiologic techniques, all of those things that I talked about before in guiding where the electrode goes. But once it's in, it's difficult for us to then see it on the MRI scan, okay? So what we do is we take a CT scan and the CT scan places the electrode pretty well. And then because it's the same brain, we can overlay the CT scan and the MRI scan. And we basically just do that. And then we trace where the electrode is on the CT scan over to the MRI, just like using a piece of tracing paper. It is much more complicated than that. It takes an incredible amount of computational power, uh, but with uh, programming uh, that has been developed in the last five, uh, five to 10 years, we can do that efficiently and effectively. And we know then exactly where the electrodes are in your brain on your MRI scan. And then the output is this. Okay, so here you see all these little bubbles. The green bubble is our target. That's the subthalamic nucleus. Okay, and that's a three-dimensional reconstruction of that small, small target in your brain, about the size of half of the end of your pinky, maybe half of your, uh, your uh, pinky nail, and the electrode in place. So see, that electrode has been traced onto that image based on your CT scan. And this is not an atlas-based reconstruction. This is not you know, a standardized reconstruction of this structure and what it should look like. This is your structure. So this is a three-dimensional reconstruction of this piece of your brain. And I can see it on the screen in 3D and I can see where the electrode is. And then that little red bubble in the middle of that, I think I have another picture here that's a little more clear, yeah. Um, but just to go back, that little red bubble is where the electricity is going. So now that I know where I'm stimulating, it's much easier for me to make conclusions about 
the symptoms that you might be having or the side effects that you might be having. It's not as if you can't do this without the image, but it really does give you an additional tool and an additional piece of information that is quite powerful. All right, so that's another very exciting uh, development in the field. And so this is just a really nice depiction, I think, of that electrical field on the electrode. So this is, this is the electrode that's placed into the brain. It's probably in reality about the width of a, a piece of spaghetti, probably even about half of that, like a angel hair pasta. And everywhere the red is, is where the electricity is, okay? And so when we use the capabilities of the device, we can shape the field of the electricity very, very well. And we can send it exactly where we, where we want it to go. And in reality, it's not gonna, you know, it's not gonna continuously spin, but this video shows you the capability, the amount of flexibility we have with the more advanced modern electrodes in shaping that electric field. And I'll just stop it here. We can send the electricity out from one direction and we can do it in such a way that it is stimulating that green target really effectively, but it's avoiding surrounding structures. And the reason we do that is because some of these surrounding structures can produce side effects. Okay, so that, that degree of flexibility and that amount of information is new and is only going to improve with time. That really gives us a lot of power to treat symptoms without producing side effects. Now, I, I don't want to over, overstate this. We, without image guidance, can do this extremely effectively. And we've, for the last 20 years, learned how to do this at the bedside and, and use your exam and what you report to us in, in your day-to-day -day life to shape the way that the electricity is delivered. But again, this is a, a nice tool that's been developed that uh, we're starting to use much more often. And uh, in many cases has been, has been quite useful. Uh, the way that I use this is often to confirm what I see uh, in the clinic with a patient. So uh, when I'm examining them, I, I see a symptom respond. And then I check the image guidance to see if that makes sense based on where the electricity is and what structure that I think I'm stimulating. And usually there's a, there's a fairly good concordance. Uh, there's a good match. So I think that really brings us to the end. This is our USC team uh, that I just wanted to throw up on the screen because you know everybody's smiling so nicely, and um, and you you'd be um, I'd be very happy to get an email from anybody, and uh, PCLA can provide my contact information if you have any questions beyond our session today. Um, but thank you all for your attention, and 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 let's uh, let's get started on the Q and A. Oh, Angela, I think you're. I think you're just muted there. Thank you very much. Um, and as I was saying, muted. Um, thank you. I, several people have already put some questions into the chat. Please continue to do so. And I'm just going to start from the top um, of the chat list and go work my way down because they all are very good questions. Um, I have 20 questions, if you know. <laughs> but I won't. Good. I'm going to remove. Hold off on my own. Um, very, uh, really interesting. Lots so much, so much to to chew on and take in there. Um, the first question is: I have dystonia in my left arm. Levodopa is not helping. Can DBS alleviate dystonia? It, DBS can be helpful for treating dystonia. Yes, and in some cases, um, when the medications are not effective, DBS can be. Uh, can be more effective. It really depends on when the dystonia is happening, um, at what cycle of, uh, where in your medication dosage it's happening, for example. Is it, an, is it happening when the meds are working really, really well? So sort of at the peak of efficacy, or is it, is it one of the symptoms that happen along with stiffness and slowness and tremor? So one of those off symptoms. That's going to change the way that we think about treating it with deep brain stimulation. Some, some people have dystonia without Parkinson disease, right? Dystonia can occur on its own as an isolated syndrome or isolated disorder. And we, we actually do use DBS to treat dystonia as well. And so it can be very effective for, for treatment of dystonia, yes. But usually deep brain stimulation is reserved for, um, for people who are not responding to Botox treatment or medications. Mm. This person also would like to know if it's true that speech can be a side effect of DBS. Yes. 
that's one of the side effects that we worry about is an effect on speech, slurring or softening of the speech are two of the more common effects. And just like other side effects, it's usually the case that we can change the way the electricity is delivered and minimize those side effects. So that is where the image guidance really comes into play because there may be a structure that we see is really well correlated with the side effect. So in this case, every time your speech is effective, I might see that that little red electricity bubble is hitting you know, um, the uh, structure called the internal capsule, but you know, it doesn't matter any particular structure. Uh, and we can then avoid that using the image guidance uh, and that can really supplement our, our clinical exam and your experience. You know, this stimulation is really good for my speech. This affects it much, much more severely. Does that, does that make sense? Um, I was wondering, does, so is, can that, can those adjustments those that you're talking about only be done during the surgical process or is that something you can do um, through the technology? Do you understand? Absolutely. And I'm glad you asked that question. So everything that I've spoken about with image guidance is actually only coming into play after the surgery is done. So then we're in this period where we've done the initial programming, you know, it's been a month since the surgery, we've turned the device on, and then I'm seeing you every three months thereafter. So it might have been five or 10 years since the surgery. And now you've developed a little bit of a side effect because of a change in the way the electricity is being delivered or um, because of a change in how Parkinson disease is affecting you and it's interacting with the, uh, with the stimulation. So these are all things that we adjust to over time, over time. Amazing. Okay. Thank you. If gait gets better with meds, it is likely to get better with stimulation. I guess they were saying, is it likely to get better with stimulation? And I'm assuming is their person is talking about deep brain stimulation. Yeah, I'm sure they are. Um, or I would think that they are. So I'm going to stop my share actually, unless anybody has any objections to that. And so we can just chat in the chat in our group. Um, it is more likely that balance and gait problems will respond to stimulation if they respond to meds. Um, yes, yes. But it's not always a guarantee, especially postural and balance problems. There can be a lot of contributors to that symptom. So if you're falling a lot, it can be because you're postural reflex, your ability to regain your balance when you start to fall has become impaired. That's one explanation, right? Another is that the movement of your feet and legs is, is slowed. Your step height is not as great, right? So you're stepping much more shorter steps and, and with less height, and you're tripping on objects more frequently, and then you're falling. Or it may be that when you're making a turn, that you're having some of that freezing, that you're having those stutter steps and having a great difficulty reinitiating the turn. All three of those are, are different contributions to gait and balance problems, but they're not all going to respond the same way to stimulation. The step height and the step length, they might improve quite well, but the postural stability, that those reflexes that help you regain your posture when you start to fall, that's very unlikely to respond to the stimulation. And so, Elements of your walking and your balance may improve, yes, but not. It's it's certainly no guarantee, and the and the best nuanced answer is going to come from a really thorough examination and discussion with with your neurologist. Uh, the same person would like to know if three programming sessions, you aren't a little better. What should you do? Well, three isn't very much. I will say that sometimes it takes us the full, you know, sometimes it takes many months to really optimize things. Mm. Um, some strategies that can be taken are to, uh, you know, there's, there are uh, lots of people doing programming. And so sometimes it's, if you're with your movement disorders neurologist in the community, sometimes it can be useful to go back to the center that implanted your deep brain stimulation. And they almost always have a movement disorders neurologist like myself, who is working with patients and, and, um, and they can perhaps try some programming changes. But that's really only a strategy that I would suggest taking, you know, 
after a number of months of not seeing the results that you're hoping. Um, if, if you're working with the center that did the initial implant, then it, then it may be that um, uh, seeing a movement disorders specialist at another center uh, could be useful. You know, getting that second opinion is always, is always an option. Um, but the, uh, the expectation is often that we'll see, you know, from, from the side of a, some, a person with Parkinson disease, the expectation is often that we'll see benefit really quickly. Um, but, uh, you know, I always do counter that by saying it took you many years to get to this point, five, 10, 15 years, and it's going to take us a good number of months to, to, to see some improvement just based on, just based on the speed of, of um, how things have changed in the past. Yeah, that's, that's huge. Thank you so much for sharing that because I think setting up expectations is so, so important. If we know going in that this is going to be six months to a year process, well, you know, you, your hope can be maintained better. So thank you. Yeah. Why is MICC better? I do not know what MICC is. Um, it, on the last slide, um, multiple independent current control is MICC. Yes. So thanks for asking that question. Um, it is um, multiple independent current control means that each one of those, I could show you the picture. Um, and if this isn't clear from my explanation, I'll go back to the slide. But on that, on that electrode, there are uh, eight different contacts. I was just reviewing, do all of the manufacturers offer eight contacts? Yes, they're all the same, eight contacts. Um, where the electricity can go. And in some cases, those eight contacts are powered by you know, one power source each. Okay, so that allows you to give a little bit of electricity here and a little bit less there and a little more there and none there. You know, in other cases, they're, they're powered by uh, fewer. So you, the, the distribution of the electricity, there's a little more limitation of that. Yeah, so the answer to your question is yes. Uh, multiple independent current control is better. It gives us more flexibility. Um, do you need it? No, you don't. Um, you can have excellent results from a device that doesn't offer multiple independent current control. And for the first 15 years of use of these devices uh, in the United States, we didn't have that. Uh, and and patients, did, uh, patients found excellent, significant benefit from, from DBS. Thank you. Um, if you have DBS, will it impact future treatment options such as stem cell or gene therapies? And does the surgery damage any brain tissue? So that's a separate question. Yes. So the, the answer to your first question is it depends. And the gene therapy and um, stem cell therapy trials that I've seen uh, often exclude patients who have had deep brain stimulation. Hmm. So it is, a cons it is a consideration, and I will say that we are five, at least five years out from uh, the kind of trial that would demonstrate reliable, you know, like a phase three trial that demonstrates reliable, consistent efficacy of a gene therapy or um, a, uh, I'm sorry, a stem cell therapy. Yes. Yeah, thank you. So you know, it's a far cry to, to wait. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot to ask of yourself to wait five years. If you're at a point where DBS can help you to wait five years for, to consider, you know, an, another therapy, which might not uh, come through the door. So th that's, again, a nuanced conversation that would be best to have with your neurologist and movement disorders specialist. But um, that would be my answer. And the second question, does it damage brain tissue? Yes, every neurosurgery damages brain tissue. Um, and the point of the field and is to minimize the effects of that damage. So when we implant the electrodes, for example, we, well, the neurosurgeon, I'm sorry, chooses a path for that electrode where the brain tissue that is sort of moved aside and pushed aside by the electrode is not brain tissue that would cause uh, a symptom if it was damaged. Thank you, thank you. Uh, somebody else would like to know if they can turn off DBS when they're asleep. 
Uh, you can. Yeah, actually, I, I, sorry, I, I do just want to add one thing to my previous answer, just to give everybody a, a fair uh, exposure to risks. Um, anytime we're doing a neurosurgical procedure, there's a risk of bleeding uh, in the brain. So where the electrode goes, if it, if it nicks a blood vessel, that can cause bleeding in the area um, and a form of stroke. And there can also be you know, a risk of infection. And the, the risk is somewhere of bleeding. The risk is somewhere between 1% and 5%. And in less than 1% of cases, does that bleeding cause symptoms? But if the, if the question was sort of around what is the risk of surgery and could the surgery cause symptoms of a stroke, the, the risk of that happening is less than 1%, but it, does, it is certainly there. Um, so sorry, just to add to my previous answer. And the, this question was... The can we turn off DBS when sleeping? Right, uh, you can. And in certain cases, um, essential tremor, for example, is a, is a tremor disorder that's different from Parkinson's disease. We often suggest to patients that they can turn the device off. So it certainly can be done, but in most cases, people with Parkinson's disease don't need to do that and don't benefit from it being turned off at night. If you have DBS, when do you stop your meds? The easy answer to that question is that you don't, and that, and that DBS isn't a replacement for medications. In some cases, based on where we stimulate in the brain, we can decrease the amount of medications that you take. And that's especially useful for patients who are having, people who are having side effects from the meds. If nausea or hallucinations or dizziness when standing, that kind of intolerance to the medication, we can sometimes decrease the medication if we stimulate in the subthalamic nucleus, just to give a little more detail. Um, but we don't always stimulate in the subthalamic nucleus for many reasons. And, and so sometimes we stimulate in the globus pallidus, the GPI, the other structure, it's necessary to stay on almost as much medication. And so I, I, I emphasize to, to people that the goal of DBS is not to be on less medication unless, unless you really can't tolerate the medications that you're taking for one reason or another. Um, the goal should be improving your function, improving your symptoms and improving your quality of life. And if, if, if medications are affecting your symptoms or your quality of life, then that's a very important consideration to us. But it, on its own, the, the goal of DBS is not to just reduce medications for the sake of reducing medications. And that's a, that's a, that's a hard pill to swallow, no pun intended. For some, for some people that I work with, because it's hard to be on meds four or five times a day. Um, and so it's a conversation, you know, with every person, it's a little different, um, but it's not always our primary goal. Okay. Um, this is a question about taking meds when you have a DBS. Is cinnamon better taken one at a time rather than two at a time? And the secondary question is, is seligaline, seligaline the extra medication? Selegi yeah, seligaline is, is a booster medication, yeah, so to speak. And no, it's not better to take one or, one or two tablets. It really just depends on how the medication is affecting your symptoms and what side effects, if any, it's causing. So that's a, that is just individualized uh, together with your doctor. Okay, um, I, I, that's all I see in the chat, but I had a few, please, if you have questions, throw them in the chat. Or if you also, if you have a question and you don't feel comfortable typing and you wanna just unmute yourself, please feel free to do that as well. Um, I was curious about this whole gait and balance issue regarding DBS. And I've heard from several different sources that it helped dyskinesias and um, tremors dramatically, but some people felt, two people I've talked to in particular, that it made their balance or, or gait worse. And I'm just, I was thinking, well, I wonder, was, is that from the DBS? Is, the, is that just the coincidence that their balance happened to get worse around the same time? Or if it is actually definitely from DBS, do you, um, have ways of helping people with that, um, with, you know, tweaking it and et cetera. It's a big, yes. big question. No, and a really important question. 
yes, DBS can affect gait and balance. And it's one of the known side effects of stimulation, uh, of, of both of all of the targets of stimulation, actually, for different reasons. There has been a lot of research in trying to understand exactly why. And if there's one place that the electricity is going, for example, that's producing that change. And just the, the simple answer to that is no. I mean, there's not one contributing factor that is most important, but it's different for, for everyone. Um, and again, that goes back to, you know, what's the, what's the cause of the gait imbalance problem? It's quite different in different people, right? Like I was saying before. Um, and so there's not, you know, one single place that is, uh, the focus of side effects for that problem. Is that something um, that like, like that is, a can be just a process. It can take one or two years to actually refine it. Do you, do you know what I mean? Is that part of the whole, co uh, programming process after the surgery, or is it something that you can, cannot help by tweaking the electrodes you are you often can help by tweaking the way that the stimulus the tweaking the electrodes so to speak it, it by tweaking the way the stimulation is delivered and there's a number of things that we can troubleshoot to try to do that um and it is a process you know it often takes months and sometimes we have good results from making changes in where the electricity is going or how it's going and there's a number of different strategies that we can take and that have been studied in the literature to to improve gait balance and freezing um, with stimulation of the, of the globus pallidus and, and more of the subthalamic nucleus. That said, sometimes it's not a problem with the DBS at all. And so all of the things that we try and sometimes even change, turning the stimulation off, we see that the gait imbalance problems are just continuing to get worse. And then we conclude that it's, a, it's, it's because of the way that the Parkinson's disease is changing. Mm -hmm. And in that case, the fundamental treatment and the most important is physical therapy. So these things need to be done concurrently, right? Seeing a really good neurologic physical therapist, a physical therapist with training in, in uh, neurologic disorders is crucial to maintaining, you know, gait and balance and preventing falls. And so we do, we do the same things. I was really hmm. hoping you would say that. Yeah. And exercise, right? It, that, they, that that actually can help. That's really good to know. Yeah, it can. It can. And those are by far the more important measures. So while we're, you know, while we're um, messing around with the stimulation, you know, over, uh, over months, we always refer to physical therapy at the same time so that we approach it from multiple angles. I'm still, I'm still, I have, I can ask him, um, Dr. Mason, questions, but please unmute yourself or add questions in the chat if you have any. May I, may I ask a question? Yes, go ahead, Dennis. You can hear me? Oh, good. Um, I have an implant. It's a, I don't know the terminology, but it's a dual implant. They're using one side for my Parkinson's which is on my right leg and right side of my, my body. Now, after six years, essential tremors has developed in my left side. And it's getting worse by the day. Is it possible to use the other side of the dual unit to target essential tremors? Uh, yeah, and, and so... I'm sorry, sir, but, but uh, you had the stimulator placed originally for essential tremors, correct? No, on the for, right. Parkinson's. Parkinson's. for Parkinson's disease. Okay, well, this is a, it's a complex question and there's a lot there um, that we could talk about. Um, but if you only have one electrode in place and you have a battery that has space for two, then yes. it would be quite easy to use that second side of the battery and just connect it to another electrode. And of course you would need a second surgery for that. Um, I mean, in this in this setting, it's it's really difficult to comment on more with more detail than that, but it can be done absolutely. And okay. Deb Deb actually in the chat just uh, asked, is it better to have both sides done at once? Um, different centers have different feelings about this, um, but we at USC do both sides. If there are symptoms on both sides, we'll implant both sides uh, at once and uh, to a single battery. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, uh, what measures do you take to minimize infection and bleeding during the surgery? Well, it's it's twofold. Uh, infection is just all of the all of the things that that a surgeon always does. Uh, sterile technique and sterile preparation and good operating room uh, control with the nurses and everybody involved to make sure that uh, nothing is brought into the room that shouldn't be there um, and to minimize the time of surgery as well. And then minimizing bleeding is all about using the information from your MRI scan to avoid blood vessels. And, um, and you know, in the vast majority of cases, that's, that, uh, that's more than enough. Again, the risk of, of bleeding is, is in and around two to five in a, in a hundred, probably on the lower side of that range. And the risk of symptoms from the bleeding is, is even lower, less than 1%. So um, the it, real answer to your question is that we use, uh, we use the MRI to help uh, avoid blood vessels. I don't do that. I should speak again. The neurosurgeon does that. I don't do that. <laughs> uh, it's on, along the same lines. I've heard some people getting infections from this disease, from the disease, from the operation. Um, is that... How, how much from what you've seen, how much of that is like, I live alone. And I just think if I had something like that, would it be hard for me to know that my wound was infected? You know, is it how much of it is people who may not be able to monitor themselves well are getting infections or how much of this is just part of the potential hazards of having it? Um, do you know what I mean? How much, is that clear, that question? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it is. It is clear. Again, there, there are a lot of pieces to the answer to that question. It, it depends on, yes, uh, the kind of post-operative care that somebody has at home, being able to keep the area clean. It also depends on the on the disorder that we're treating. So we know that patients with isolated dystonia have more infections than patients with um, with Parkinson disease, and so there's some characteristics of the way that the, the, the disorder affects body um, that are important. It's also the case that most of the infections that happen with the DBS device occur when the device is being replaced rather than that initial implantation. Uh, so with that, there's something about the way that the replacement is, um, well, I should say that there's, it's likely has to do with the way that the body heals around the battery mm -hmm. and the pocket, the scarring around the pocket that limits the ability to fight infection in that area over time. Um, so all of those are sort of elements of an answer to that question. Uh, I'm sensitive to your time. It's 12.01. Do you want to take one last well, we, question? Or? I mean, we could, we could talk for hours and, and hours. Let's, absolutely. Let's take a couple, a couple last questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, which is more complex, surgery or programming? <laughs> um, you should ask my neurosurgery colleagues about that. <laughs> I think that you'll get, you'll get lots of different answers. I think the... Um, the reality is that the that there's a reason there's a reason that there's jokes about brain surgery you know difficult things not being brain surgery right so brain surgery is incredibly complex and the technologies that we have to make it more consistent and reliable are also incredible and really improve outcomes okay and then at the same side the programming is what is 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 equally important to improving your quality of life and your symptoms and having somebody who's really well versed in programming and uh, with a good deal of experience and also has enough expertise to hear what you're saying and understand your examination and translate that to the programming device uh, is important. So it's just that they're complicated in very different ways. The surgeon needs to do a good job and his job lasts um, hours to days to weeks, right? Depending. And the neurologist needs to do a good job and, and his or her job, I'm sorry, lasts years. Okay, so the complexity just comes from the different time time frames. Um, along the same line of questioning, how sensitive is the area around where the battery is placed? Uh, most, oh, sorry, Angela. No, go ahead. Most of the time it's, it's is no longer able to be felt after you know some weeks to months mm. and you just get used to it and it's like it's not even there but sometimes there can be pain 
So in some cases, the uh, surgeon needs to revise where the battery is placed and place it either deeper or in a different spot to minimize that pain. Um, it's, it's uncommon, but it can happen. Most of the time it's, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of, it's in there and you forget about it. Yeah. Is there a kind of person like a small framed person or a thinner person who might have a harder time with it because it's big and, you know, that's right. Yeah. It, it does tend to be the case that smaller people with a lower uh, body fat percentage, lower body mass index, BMI tend to feel that battery a little bit more. And so that's a reason that we really encourage people to keep good weight on, keep exercising, keep eating well. Gotcha. And uh, PD dystonia. Somebody has a question about dystonia. How is dystonia? I think, yeah, you, I understand you had said something about PD dystonia dis, besides other kinds of dystonia. Mm hmm. I'm yeah, just asking how, how, how those are different. Dystonia can, can be a symptom or a disease. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. yep. Wow. So that is actually a separate disease category. It can be. Yes. It can yep. be. It's more rare to, to occur as a separate disease, but it can, it can occur. Interesting. Which vendor has the smallest battery? I don't know which one is the, uh, now the, the vendor with the smallest battery is going to be mad at me for not knowing the answer to this question, but I don't know. There is one, uh, they're all similar. And once it's in there, it, it, the differences are negligible. Gotcha. The, the bigger difference between vendors is the difference between a rechargeable battery and a, and a single charge battery. Um, the rechargeable battery is smaller because it doesn't have to carry as much charge at any given time. And so if you're really looking for a small battery, um, then using a rechargeable will, mm -hmm. will give you that. Great. And then Donald Kelly, I don't know if you can see his, his chat questions. Oh yeah. Let me see. Uh, seems that there is little set way to program principles plus anatomy plus time trial and error. So I can sort of infer the question from that. I think what Donald is asking is, is, is programming an art or a science? Mm. And uh, it is both. There are principles for, to the deep brain stimulation programming that have been defined and that we use every day and with every patient. And there is also some subtle art involved in interpreting the results of the stimulation and interpreting um, side effects and knowing what step to take next. Um, that can be different from, for different people. Um, but until we define more and more with science and, and, you know, rigorous research, uh, the, the, uh, the artistic method is, um, uh, of, of greater relative importance, but I think, you know, it really is both. Thank you. All right. I, for everyone's time, I think we will end on that question. Very interesting question. And I'm glad you understood it. <laughs> um, I just put a link in the chat that will take you to where we post all of our videos, all of our webinars. And usually it's posted within 24 hours of the webinar. And we also will send you out the link of the webinar in email. So you registered for this. Anybody who registered for this will receive an email from Sarah with the link directly to this specific video but we also have many other great videos on our website you can spend your life on our website um but uh thank you so much um dr mason that was fascinating so um, our brains are so amazing and i had 20 more questions i would have loved to have asked you but they were just curiosity so um well, but yeah, it's, it's always a pleasure to be here and really nice to see everybody and, and uh, interact a little bit. Um, so uh, reach out if, if you have any more questions. It's, it, it's always a pleasure. Okay. Um, how would you want them to reach out to you if they had a question? I think the best would be, uh, you know, contact Sarah. You have her email address. I, my email was up at the end of the talk uh, for a period of time, but feel free to email me directly. And, and if I need to route your message to our clinic coordinators, I'll do so. But I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to receive emails. Great, and Sarah just put her email in the um, 
chats for you. And if you don't know Sarah, she is the woman who does all the magic for us and gives you all the resources you need. She's amazing. So um, anyway, thank you again, Dr. Mason. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We hope you will join us again later this month for a Q&A with Dr. Melita Petrosian about the latest advances in Parkinson's treatments. We will email you a link to register for this link. Um, we're also really excited to announce, this is really exciting and fun, that PCLA has been selected to be an official charity partner of the LA Marathon and the LA Big 5K race. So if you're in the Los Angeles area, even if you're not, you can fundraise for us. Uh, we invite you to join us for the LA Big 5K on Saturday, March 18th next year and help us raise funds for our support and education programs for the Parkinson's community. You'll receive an email um, on de details on how to join us for this. Uh, today's event was made possible by our wonderful sponsor, Boston Scientific, and by you. By donating to PCLA, you can join us in our mission to improve the lives of the families in our community who are living with Parkinson's. PCLA is a nonprofit and all donations are tax deductible. If you enjoyed today's program, please also consider donating at PCLA.org and help us continue our work and continue to provide programs like this for free. As always, reach out to us with questions. The wonderful Sarah will be there to answer them for you at info at PCLA.org or by phone at 310-880-3143. Thank you, thank you everyone, and stay safe and stay well.